Good evening, and welcome to Congregation on Che Torah's Scholar in Residence Program. My name is Robin Feldman, and I'm the Director of Programming and Member Engagement at On Che Torah. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to hear our keynote, Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer. Before we begin, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. All participants will remain on mute throughout the program. If you would like to submit a question for Dr. Kurtzer, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. These questions will remain private and will only be seen by our presenter. The usual chat feature will be disabled during the event. If you would like to use closed captioning, please click on the small CC button found at the bottom right of your screen. Please note that this is a service provided by Zoom and includes automated transcription. During the evening, if you have any uh, technical difficulties, please feel free to email me at programming at entretora.org and we will work as quickly as possible to resolve any technical issues. Don't worry if you miss any portion of the evening as we are recording and the presentation will be made available on Anche Torah's YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us for what is going to be an incredible evening. Please welcome the chair of our Scholar in Residence Weekend, Warren Harmel. Good evening. Thanks, Robin. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight to the 11th anniversary of the Arnie Sweet Lecture Series, which honors the legacy of Arnie Sweet, who was a greatly admired and beloved leader of the Dallas Jewish community for many years. Tonight, I have three things I'd like to address very briefly. Firstly, 
Our thanks to all our sponsors and donors, for without your support, we would not be able to bring the leading voices in the contemporary Jewish world to the community in Plano and Dallas. In particular, our thanks to our presenting sponsors, the family of Arnie Sweet, Janice and Art Weinberg, Cindy and Mitch Moskowitz, and Kathy and Joel Brook. Our special thanks also to our Ned to Mood sponsors, Debbie and Manuel Rajanov, and once again, a big thank you to all of you, our sponsors. Secondly, and very importantly, my thanks to everybody on the Scholarly and Residence Committee and the rabbis and the staff at Anshe Torah for all their dedication to make this an outstanding signature event for us. Special thanks to Karen Reed, Robin Feldman and Elisa Mackler and their teams who helped them for the many, many hours they've spent to make this a success, particularly in the age of COVID. Thirdly, a big, although perhaps a virtual, Texas welcome to Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer. Yehuda, we live in very challenging times, and I know that you have lots of challenging ideas to share with us tonight and tomorrow. Tonight, there'll be time for a Q&A after Dr. Kurtzer's talk, and please use the chat function, the, the Q&A function to submit questions or comments. Tonight, it is very fitting that you'll hear from Janice and Arnie's daughters, Sindhi Moskowitz and Kathy Brook. It is clear that apples do not fall very far from the tree. Cindy will be the facilitator for tonight's Q&A after Dr. Kutze has spoken, Kutze has spoken, and Kathy will now introduce Dr. Yehuda Kutze. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you, Warren, for all that you and the Scholar Committee do and have done for the past 11 years. I know we're in for another wonderful experience this year. And I know that we're all thinking of your dear Athene tonight, whose yard site was just weeks ago. So mom gave me the opportunity to say a word about what brought us together tonight. The Arnie Sweet Scholar in Resident Lecture Series is of course named for my dad and Cindy and Susan's dad, Arnie Sweet. He loved to learn from Jewish thinkers. He loved knowledge, digging into intense topics, hearing from all sides, not always coming to conclusions, but expanding his understanding, sometimes finding humor, always searching for, and often finding common ground, and always remaining optimistic. While dad may have never heard a podcast, like for instance, Human um, Hartman's Identity Crisis, hosted by our scholar, which can be found at identitycrisispod.com, or experienced a Zoom webinar, he would have so appreciated the following about our scholar, Yehuda Kurtzner. I quote, who is the co-creator of the Shalom Hartman Institute's I Engage project, which, seek, which seeks to bridge between Israel and the world, Jewry, through content, curriculum, and cutting edge educational programs. We can all look forward to learning this evening from Yehuda about the American Jewish story and what it means to be an American Jew. When we look back at the past 11 years of Anche Tour's scholar in residence program, I think we can all be incredibly proud and grateful for the quality and diversity of our scholars, and Yehuda is no exception. Dr. Yehuda Kurtzner is president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, a leading thinker and author on the meaning of Israel to American Jews, on Jewish history, Jewish memory, and on questions of leadership and change in American Jewish life. Yehuda has led the creation led the creation of the Institute in 2010 as a pioneering research and educational center for the leadership of North American Jewish community and teaches on its many platforms for rabbis, lay leaders, and Jewish professionals and leaders of other faith communities. Growing up, Yehuda's father was ambassador to Egypt and Israel. Yehuda received his doctorate in Jewish studies from Harvard an MA in religion from Brown, and is an alumnus of both the Bronfman Youth and Wexner Graduate Fellowships. Previously, Yehuda served as faculty, a faculty member at Brandeis, where he held the inaugural chair in Jewish communal innovation. In addition to the I Engage 
project and the podcast. Yehuda is the author of Shuva, The Future of the Jewish Past and co-editor of the New Jewish Canon, a collection of the most significant Jewish ideas and debates of the past two generations. Yehuda's wife, Stephanie Ives, who according to Yehuda has the hardest job in the world as head of a Jewish day school, live in New York with their three children. Yehuda, it's my honor and pleasure to now turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you to everybody involved with this. It's um, it's truly an honor to see my name on that list of the scholars and residents who have been uh, with your community with Anche Torah. I'm disappointed to not be there with you uh, in person. I think that's the requisite thing we have to say around this pandemic. But um, but I'm truly grateful for the invitation and uh, and want to thank uh, Warren gave all the thanks. So I'll, I'll reinforce all of those. Uh, but uh, but especially to the sweet families and all the sponsors for making this event possible tonight. And I'm excited to be learning with you uh, even across this distance. We'll try our best to feel as though we're uh, we're in the same uh, in the same space. My question tonight for us here as American Jews is very simply, what are we doing here? It's a more uh, complicated and subtle question than it sounds like. I'm not asking the question of what do we do professionally, what do we do as individuals, or even what does a synagogue mean? I want to ask a much larger question about what we think we are doing here as American Jews in America. And obviously one of the subtexts to that is we are living through an extraordinary moment in Jewish history when there is a Jewish homeland, and it's not here. When there is a Jewish sovereign state in the land of Israel, something we have dreamed about for a long time, and we as American Jews have opted to live in a different place. And that forces us to ask some really great questions, some exciting questions, and maybe some challenging ones for us to figure out what is the story of what it means to be an American Jew at this time in Jewish history. To spill out this question, I want to share with you three stories. They're going to sound self-promotional. They're not. They're just moments uh, that I've had experiencing uh, uh, my own American Jewishness over the last 10 years that helped me formulate the questions that we're going to talk about tonight. The first story, I want to say it was about 10 years ago. I was invited because I run a Jewish organization. Apparently, this is a thing. Uh, I was as surprised as you would be. I was invited to a reception at the residence of then Vice President Biden's home. It was around the time of the high holidays. It was for American Jewish leaders uh, as a kind of um, greet, meet and greet with the Vice President. We were standing outside by the Vice President's pool. Now this is at the US Naval Observatory in Washington where the Vice President's residence uh, is. And Vice President Biden gave a little talk welcoming the crowd there and concluded with a story that Vice, that now President Biden has actually told for a long time. It was the first time that I had heard it, but it was very clear when he started telling this story that a lot of the people around the room, mostly Washington insiders, which I am not, uh, had heard the story before. And the story effectively was the first time that he had met with then Prime Minister Golda Meir. He was a junior senator from the state of Delaware. And uh, this is probably in the early 70s. And the prime minister had said to Senator Biden at the time, you know, um, we Jews are never, this project of Israel, we're never going to leave. Um, it's never going to fail. And Senator Biden, who was then a novice to the foreign policy world, was kind of surprised as, you know, after all, 25 years into Israel's founding, Israel had been through already three wars uh, of existential significance. And he said, why is that? And Prime Minister Golda Meir said to him, because we have nowhere to go, because we Jews have nowhere to go. And this was his concluding comment at this reception at the vice president's residence to a group of American Jews. And he said, that reinforces my support for Israel because the Jews have nowhere else to go. Everybody applauded politely and moved on to the other portion of the evening. I want to tell you personally, I was frozen in place. We have nowhere to go. As a good story for describing uh, Senator, then Vice President, and soon to be President Biden's relationship to Israel, and why, the, why Biden would always be pro-Israel. Okay, that's a good story. That helps to describe why remain committed to the project of the state of Israel. But at a reception celebrating American Jews, in fact, if you said to me, um, the Jews have nowhere to go, I looked around at this group of Jews who almost everyone else in Jewish history would have been awed at standing comfortably in the home of the Vice President of the United States 
in the home and in proximity to the greatest superpower that the world knows. American Jews who were enacting in that moment a profound sense of at-homeness in America to say to us, we have nowhere else to go, was simply astonishing to me. I felt this strange feeling of, why do we Jews tell a story publicly that we have nowhere to go besides the state of Israel, especially those of us American Jews who have decided uh, not to live there? I want you to freeze that moment, I'll tell you a second story. The second story is uh, what took place on the eve of election day uh, in 2016. The following night, I guess this is bad planning from a kind of scholar in residence perspective. The following night, I was scheduled to give a lecture at a synagogue. And I think the reason that I had scheduled that lecture at a liberal progressive synagogue on the Upper West Side of Manhattan was because in this part of the country, in the blue states, there was a widespread assumption that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election, that the Trump candidacy would have been repudiated as a kind of strange footnote in history. And for the most part, the American Jewish story would have plotted on business as usual. And so they had scheduled a lecture for that uh, the following night, the night after uh, the election uh, in 2016. And I was meant to go to a synagogue and give a lecture about intermarriage. Recent intermarriage is an important topic for us American Jews to talk about, and I'll get into this a little bit later and over the course of these couple of days, is that intermarriage represents the most profound success of the American Jewish assimilation project. Now, many of us in the Jewish world tend to think that assimilation is a bad word. It's the thing that separates us from the thickness of our Judaism. The truth is, assimilation has been the project of American Jews for over 100 years. And what has been jarring to many of us is that I'm not sure that any of us, certainly 100 years ago, and even in the past 20 or 30 years, realized quite how good we could be at it, quite how successful it could be. And so my topic was to talk to a liberal congregation about how we think about the transformation of Jewish identity that we have been living through um, in our own lifetimes over the span of the last 30 or 40 years. Well, I'm watching the news on the night of election night, and it looks like there is going to be a massive disruption in the American Jewish story. I think the election of Donald Trump, whatever you think about it, was revolutionary in a lot of ways. And, um, and the rabbi, who I'm meant to go to the following night to their synagogue, is texting me saying, I don't think we can do a lecture tomorrow night on intermarriage. Instead, I showed up and they said, just come to the shul. And uh, about 400 people showed up and uh, in a liberal synagogue in New York effectively had the mood of a shiva house. What were they sitting shiva for? It's not clear, but my hy core hypothesis, and it's what we're going to explore a little bit tonight, is that many of them were experiencing a, a feeling that something was going deeply wrong in the relationship between Jewishness and America that for a long time has felt incredibly synthetic, deeply intertwined, the thriving of Jews in America and the thriving of America itself. And this constituted a, a disruption. I felt, I think, on that night that for many people in that room, and I think really continuing over the last number of years, uh, especially with the rise of American anti-Semitism, a growing sense of, is this the place that we thought it was? A third story for you was that I had the honor of teaching uh, a few years ago on Capitol Hill to a group of American congressmen. Again, talk about weird timing. It was scheduled for the day of the final vote on impeachment the first time around uh, during the Trump presidency. And so you had a situation on Capitol Hill where it was actually perfectly set up for a Torah study class for Jewish members of Congress because congressmen at that point for about four hours had nothing to do. They were still going to do other business. They were waiting for the Senate uh, to vote. And so they had time. And so everybody showed up about ten, know, seven to 10 members of Congress for a Torah study session. And I sat with them and I just asked them a question, which was, is America home? Remember, these are American elected officials who happen to be Jewish. And right away, one of the elected officials, one of the members of Congress said, yeah, of course it is. This is where we have set up our home. This is where we, uh, this is where we, this is our destiny. We are meant to be here. Another Jewish member of Congress across the table said, absolutely not. We have to be ready to leave as soon as we have to. First member of Congress looks back and says, look at you, you're a congressman. 
You're sitting in the halls of power. You've achieved anything imaginable for what a minority population could do. And he was resolute in his response that there is nothing different about the American Jewish story than any other diaspora in history. So this is my question. Is America home to us as Jews? What does it mean even when it is experiencing turbulence in the relationship between our Jewishness and our Americanness? Why do we foster a set of stories about ourselves where if we have already decided to be here, I'm going to argue tonight that we as American Jews have decided to be here precisely because there is an alternative. If that's the case, why do we perpetuate narratives about ourselves in which we envision ourselves as only temporarily here? What does that do to us? How does it constrain us? In what ways does it hold us back from being better and more active participants in shaping the American project itself? After all, there are, I want to share five truths about American Judaism. Number one, the American Jewish community is a great Jewish community as measured by Jewish history. It is simply a great one. There's simply no other way to describe it by measured by the standards of our affluence, influence, power, and privilege. Those are uncomfortable things to say out loud publicly, partly because some of us, when we say nice things about ourselves, we're nervous that they're going to disappear. Also, to talk about the American Jewish community as being affluent and influential is the same thing that anti-Semites say about us, and so we don't want to validate that narrative about us. But it is true, and sometimes when you don't describe those realities because of the anxieties of what it means to talk about them, you don't take them really seriously as data as important commodities that define who we are as a people and that should be part of shaping what our responsibilities are to use those commodities. What does it mean for a community that has this level of affluence, influence, power, and privilege to actually use the tools at its disposal for the betterment of the society? We are a great Jewish community as measured by Jewish history objectively and comparatively. You can do the math. There have been other magnificent Jewish communities but this one may be top of the charts. In fact, I'll say this. I think there are two, probably the two greatest experiments in Jewish history of a thriving Jewish community may well be in our thousands of years of history, what we are doing here in America and what our friends in Israel are doing in the state of Israel today. We may be living in an extraordinary golden age of Jewish history. Most, most of Jewish history, when one Jewish community was experiencing a golden age, another one was suffering. Right now, the two biggest Jewish communities in the world are thriving in unprecedented ways. That's a remarkable truth. The second truth of the American Jewish community story is that, ironically, the American Jewish community is a story of continuity. I say ironically because in organized Jewish life, there's tremendous fear about lack of Jewish continuity. If you've been involved in federation life, this was one of the buzzwords of Jewish federations in the 80s and 90s, especially once we saw the results of the National Jewish Population Study, anxieties about our future, and all the language was continuity, continuity. Will we have Jewish grandchildren? Will there be a future of American Jewish life? But if you look at the map of all of the Jewish communities in the world at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, almost all of them underwent radical discontinuity over the subsequent hundred years. From North Africa to parts of Europe to even South America, all over the world, certainly in what was then Palestine and became Israel, radical rupture and discontinuity. Jews moved in enormous numbers throughout the 20th century in a search for home and homeland. One Jewish community in the world experienced essential continuity. A little bit of anti-Semitism difficult struggles to survive and thrive in America, but basically a story of Jewish continuity. Compared to almost everywhere else on earth, the American Jewish community has essentially 300 years of uninterrupted political history, and that's remarkable and something that we have to take stock of. A third truth of American Jewish community has been that it has provided a context for us to radically rethink some of our most fundamental assumptions about what Judaism even means. This is a credit to America. I alluded to the transformation of Jewish identity as exhibited in the intermarriage story, but it's bigger than that. It's not just that Jews intermarry, Jews intermarry throughout history. What American Jews are involved audaciously in doing, which is a lesson for Jewish history and a rethinking of Judaism, 
is a total shattering of the notion of some essential boundary between Jew and Gentile. Most American Jews do not believe that there is an essential difference between us and our Gentile neighbors. And what's more incredible is that our Gentile neighbors, for the most part, don't believe there is either. And in turn, America has made possible for the Jewish people the creation and proliferation of totally new ideas of Judaism, custom designed in an American context to thrive as American Jewish ideas. One of the most remarkable said ideas is the very phrase tikkun olam, which gets sourced from medieval mystical literature, meaning something totally different, but in the context of America, emerges within the context of American exceptionalism and post-Cold War American thinking to be a doctrine for Jews to imagine that we can use all of this power at our disposal, not merely to take care of ourselves, but to do something as audaciously as fixing the world. Let's own that America has made possible a context for Jews to produce a totally new Judaism. We have to name that because it helps us understand and take seriously that the cultural context which you live becomes essential to shape the Judaism that you need in order to thrive in that context. A fourth contemporary truth of American Judaism right now is that something also feels unsettled. America is engaged in a process of tremendous political polarization right now. A lot of us are feeling, especially after January 6th, a sense that something is something is ruptured, something is broken. I'm sure if you live uh, in Texas, you know that the safety and security of Jews as part of the American religious fabric is, is jeopardized right now. And for many of us, that's an existential question. If, it's, if something is broken here, uh, what does that mean for this incredible project that we've been engaged with? over the span of the last 300 years, and especially given the thriving of the past 60 or 70 years. And a final truth of the American Jewish context that helps to provide some of the footing of what I wanna push towards tonight is that we are under theorized. What do I mean by that? If you go to the bookshelf of the synagogue library, I have not been in your synagogue, but I'm gonna guess that um, having seen many American synagogues, there is a synagogue library um, and that there probably is a bookshelf, uh, one of which may have the, there may be something called American Jewish history. There's a lot of books on American Jewish history, the stuff that tells you about your past. And then there's a section called Zionism. Zionism is that category of theory, which the Jewish people develop over the span of 120 years, tremendous amount of literature of Jews figuring out what does it mean for the Jewish people to be reacquainted with questions of sovereignty and homeland. We haven't really engaged those questions as American Jews about America. In some ways, we've outsourced those questions about home and homeland and democracy to Israel itself. We talk a lot about being Jewish in America, But if you Google the phrase Jewish and democratic state, almost all of your responses are going to be about the state of Israel. Are American Jews not equally engaged in an audacious project about thinking about the relationship between what it means to be Jewish and to live within the framework of a democracy? In some ways, the original Jewish and democratic state for Jews has been the American project. So with all of this history, with all of this majesty, with all of this success, and with all of this tension, it feels like a huge gap that we have much less theoretical language to ask what what it is, in fact, that we are doing here. What does it mean to be an American Jew from the perspective of a Jewish history that has magnificent and tragic stories of diasporas in the past? Are we just one of them? You know, 15th century Spain, Uh, 19th century Morocco, early 20th century Germany, 11th century Fez. Are we that story? Are we simply a continuation of these magnificent stories of diaspora past? Or are we something exceptional? Are we something different? What kind of framework do we have at our disposal to understand what American Judaism means? And if we had such a framework, could it help us address our flaws? Could it reshape our agenda of what our leaders should be doing? Could it shape a new vision for the functions that a synagogue is supposed to have within the context of American life? And biggest of all, and I started with this, but I'll repeat it again. 
What does it mean truly for us to be at home here in America? genuinely at home, especially at this extraordinary moment in Jewish history when there is another stronger competitor for the very idea of Jewish homeland. What does it mean to feel at home, to act at home, to think of ourselves, uh, as one of my colleagues says at Hartman, um, sometimes maybe as guests, but oftentimes as hosts, to imagine ourselves as more at home at some times than other American minority groups. In fact, speaking to an African-American colleague, uh, academic, and, and talking to her about this really interesting dynamic that we as American Jews have a sense of home here and a sense of homeland there. And she said to me something I'll, I'll never forget. She says, isn't it interesting that American Jews have the possibility of two homes and many of us uh, African-Americans don't have either feel deeply detached from the homes from which we were taken when we were enslaved, and oftentimes struggle to be taken seriously as at home in this place. This idea of American Jewish at-homeness is very close to my heart. I hope you can tell. This is personal. All four of my grandparents were born in America. That's unusual among Ashkenazi observant Jews. It's not true for my children. Uh, my wife's family is uh, North African and Iraqi. And so my children have the advantage of two narratives, one of a profound American Jewish at homeness for which they are the fifth generation Americans, and that they get this other line of having grandparents who came to America more recently. My mother-in-law came to America in the 1970s, having been born in Tunisia. And with that, they get to cherish the American immigrant story in a way that for me is part of my family's much more distant past. I grew up with a story of, in many ways, a classic American Jewish immigration story. You know that movie, An American Tale? It could have been us. All four of my grand, great grand, all my grand, great grandparents came as immigrants to America in the first decade of the 20th century. That meant all of my grandparents were born here, and I am the, the manifestation of that generational phenomenon. First generation struggles to raise, uh, to raise their family here and speaks in in, in uh, broken English, a grandparents generation start businesses after the war, um, creating a situation where then their grandchildren can do things like have a job as an intellectual. That's the dream, right? Um, not have to make an honest living. I grew up in a deeply patriotic household. My grandfather fought in World War II for the US Army, was injured in the Battle of Metz on the French-Belgian border and came home with a Purple Heart. My father, as was mentioned in the introduction, was a career American foreign service officer, a diplomatic representative overseas, with no ambivalence whatsoever that an American Jew, an identifiable American Jew, could represent the American government even living in Israel. My father was groundbreaking in that respect, identifying as a Zionist, right? That was, it was, there was, the, the notion of dual loyalty is only something that we get accused of by people who can't process that we're capable of navigating these loyalties with tremendous complexity. And I grew up very much as a Zionist, a deep tie to the land of Israel, spent a lot of time there over the years, lived there at various stretches, and have decided to, to build my life here in America with a sense of pride in this place and attachment to that place over there. This story of American Jewish uh, at-homeness is, I think, unusual and remarkable, and I want to understand it more. I want you to understand it as well. What choices are implicit or explicit about the decision to construct an identity as an American Jew? What does that mean about America? What is being reshaped about your Jewishness precisely because you live here and not on a different other time in Jewish history or a different place uh, on the Jewish map? I want to suggest tonight that what America might mean to us as Jews is not just an interesting experiment or a place to live, but maybe even a redefinition of the very idea of place as it's exists in our tradition, our memory for a long time. And in that respect, this is a bigger deal, uh, one of the most extraordinary experiments that our people, the Jewish people, has ever engaged in. To do this, I want to suggest with you a thought experiment. I thought about this a lot. When does the American Jewish story begin? When does it start? If you read a Jewish history book, you might uh, identify the first uh, first people who came came to America as part of the colonial period. Now that could be, 
many of us would, tar would start by referencing our own American Jewish stories when our families may have come to this country via Ellis Island or Galveston, when our ancestors converted to Judaism here. There are a lot of possibilities. This is just a provocative hypothesis tonight, which is that the birth moment for the American Jewish community as we know it is not when the first Jews came here or when our institutions first got built. The birth moment for the American Jewish community was in 1948 when our exile, our experience of exile, transformed into something else tonight, which we'll call voluntary diaspora. Or put differently, it's when the Jewish people decide to have a homeland and some of the Jewish people decide not to live there, we have to think differently about what the relationship to homeland is. The American Jewish community represents a radical experiment in voluntary diaspora. The desire to be alive at a period in Jewish history when there is Jewish sovereignty in the place that we have dreamed to return to for a long time, and we have decided to create something else somewhere else. You see, for most of Jewish history, Jewish thought divided the world into two categories defined by both time and place. These two categories are homeland and exile. By time and place, I mean, right, place makes sense. That's the homeland. That's the one I kind of wish I could be at, and I can't. Exile is the place I actually live, right, for all sorts of reasons that are beyond my control. But it's not just a location question. It's also a time question in the sense that Jews who were in exile always dreamed of a future time when we would return to homeland. The piece of our liturgy that most powerfully captures this idea that that Jerusalem, that the land of Israel is a manifestation not only of place, but of time, is that final set of words that we utter at the end of the Passover Seder next year in Jerusalem. That is the exact intersection of time and place. We are here. We dream to be there. In our tradition, we have imagined that these two ideas, homeland and exile, are connected to one another. It's the ideal place, right, and the real place. So these are theological categories as much as they are geographic categories. They're not just describing, I'm here and I'm on my way to there in some literal sense. They are dreams and visions of the world between what it is and what we wish it could be. We wish to transform the condition of exile, perhaps with the return of God to history, perhaps the translation um, or transformation of the political world as we know it, where we are going to move from this place and go to that place. We are going to return to history by returning to our homelands. The category of exile dates back to Jeremiah and the destruction of the first temple when Jeremiah says to the bereft people who can't figure out who they are in the world, after all, right, people in the ancient world, were their identities were created on the basis of the places that they lived. If you are a Judean, you live in Judea. What does it mean to be a Judean who now lives in Babylonia? And so the obvious instinct for the people is to experience this whole thing as rupture. I guess I'm not a Judean anymore. I guess I am now a Babylonian. I guess my theological story of the world doesn't hold anymore. And Jeremiah says an incredible thing. He says, build houses, make it work, pray for the welfare of the city. One day you're gonna go back. In other words, you are gonna be in one place, which is not the place you wanna be, forging an identity that is deeply in relationship to the place that you could be at. You're gonna live somewhere temporarily, doing your best to thrive there until such a time as you can return. This travels together with one of the central themes that runs through so much of our Jewish literature. We are a people who is always ostensibly traveling towards the promised land. In fact, in most of our stories, we are much more about going towards the promised land than we are a people that actually gets there starts in the Garden of Eden, and it goes through much of the, the story of the Bible. Have you ever noticed when you get to the end of the Bible and the Israelites who have been traveling through the land of Israel for 40 years? By the way, it, it takes about six days to walk from where they were into the land of Israel, and it takes them 40 years of wandering. And you get to the end of the Torah, and they're still not in the land of Israel. Maybe that's because 
our Torah means to convey that it's much more powerful to be journeying from exile to homeland than it is to actually have to figure out what you do once you get there. It's what I call the problem of arrival. We are a people who visions ourselves as in this theological and geographic journey from exile to homeland. And that characterizes much of the last 2000 years since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So much of our rabbinic tradition is built around this idea of we live here and we kind of wish we were there. That would suggest that things are broken and imperfect in the world. We see it in things as, as subtle, even if at this point banal, as which way we pray when we're in our synagogues. The positioning of the direction towards Jerusalem is a constant reminder that sacred geography trumps local geography. The dream of Jerusalem is much more significant than the local geography of the places that we're in. Now, various movements and denominations of Judaism have challenged that over the last couple hundred years. But for a long time, we have carried this tension, this notion that we are in exile and we are returning to homeland. Diaspora, however, sounds like something different. Not the experience of, I'm here, but I wish I was there, but perhaps the story of recognizing that even when there is homeland, there may be a wanderlust. There may be a desire by some Jews to spread the seeds, which is what diaspora means in the original Greek, to live not in that homeland because something else can be created for the Jewish people by a different experience. There's one useful analogy in Jewish history to the story of American Jews that I want to share with you tonight, at least the story of American Jews post-1948, another Jewish community in history that saw itself as a voluntary diaspora. Jews who could have been living in the homeland during a period of Jewish sovereignty and elected not to. And that's the story of the Jews of Alexandria during the Second Temple period. Now, let me just set the scene for you. Remember, the Second Temple gets rebuilt and replenished in the Hanukkah story in the second century BCE. And then for roughly 200 years, the temple thrives as the center of Jewish civilization in antiquity. Now, it wasn't perfect, but then again, neither is today's state of Israel. There was political corruption. There were all sorts of religious figures who felt that the state was too religious and other figures who felt that the state wasn't religious enough. There was complicated infighting as part of the temple in Jerusalem, and some of that, as we know, led to the temple's ultimate destruction by the Romans in the year 70 CE. But you also had a modest amount of Jewish sovereignty sometimes with vassal kings, sometimes with autonomous kings. There's no question that Jews were living as roughly sovereign with certainly a great degree of uh, religious sovereignty and even territorial sovereignty that waxed and waned over this 200 year period. So what does it mean that just a couple hundred miles to the south, a Jewish community decides voluntarily to not leave Alexandria? Remember Jews have a history of leaving Egypt and going to the land of Israel. The Jews of Alexandria decide not to do that. They decide instead to construct a very different type of Jewish civilization that sees itself intertwined with the homeland, doesn't see itself in competition with the homeland, but sees itself intertwined with the homeland in ways that understood very magnificently and as a useful analogy for the present, that the thriving of one could be vital to the thriving of the other. So for instance, Jews of Alexandria do something that we as American Jews did for a long time and continue to do. We send money, attention, and support to the homeland. Jews in Alexandria and antiquity sent money to the temple. After all, they wanted their religious identities manifested in the homeland, much not that different from the amount of pain and anxiety that so many of us as liberal identifying American Jews feel when there's no space for us at the Western Wall where we get to have our Jewishness validated. I don't think it's the biggest issue in Israeli society, but that doesn't matter. If I, I don't need to live there in order to feel that the Kotel, the Western Wall, should have room for the prayers of all of world Jewry, not unlike in antiquity when Jews from around the world, especially from Alexandria, would stream in those three times a year to pray at the temple in Jerusalem. We send our money, 
our love and support. One of the metaphors that I like most about this story of the relationship between diaspora Jews and homeland Jews during this period is, I, I don't know, I'm not that good at science, but I like it for the metaphors. Jerusalem holds a centripetal and centrifugal quality over diaspora Jews. It is centripetal in the sense that it is a has a gravitational pull, right, from all around the world of money and support and attention and passions, and also centrifugal in the sense that it creates the kind of conflict that pushes us away. When I read that about the ancient world, I recognized the moment we are in. We are a people who simultaneously direct a tremendous amount of our attention and love towards the homeland. And at the same time, Israel is the thing that most divides us in the American Jewish community. Like it was in antiquity and now, living in a voluntary diaspora creates a gravitational, powerful effect with the homeland, which is something we have to learn from and think about. Alexandrian Jews, like American Jews, took pride in their cultural assimilation. The ideas of the place of Alexandria shaped Alexandrian Judaism in ways that would have been incomprehensible to Jews living in Jerusalem. I'll give you an example. In uh, the first century BC, or second century BCE rather, the Jews of Alexandria commission a translation of the Bible into Greek. You know why they have to do that? Because overwhelmingly the Jews of Alexandria don't know Hebrew, but they want to understand their tradition, much as overwhelmingly we American Jews do not speak or access Hebrew. Some people are sad about that. I look at it as the obvious consequence of living in an English speaking milieu. But it has not stemmed the tide, the powerful tide, for American Jews craving Jewish knowledge and content, looking to come to a lecture on a Sunday night in English to have a deeper and more sophisticated understanding of our Jewishness. We are in a process of a radical cultural translation all the time of Judaism, not just to be comprehensible here, but to be the outgrowth of the American idiom. We are involved in something radical here. And most of all, this story in antiquity is powerful to me because of a character named Philo of Alexandria. Philo is a little bit of a lost character in a lot of our traditional Jewish history, but Philo says exactly the idea that I'm going to try to get at tonight, which is Philo says there is no contradiction between feeling a sense of home for the place I live and a sense of loyalty for the homeland. I can feel both. I have sometimes felt this in my own life. I go to Israel a lot, um, usually for work now, um, since I came to the Hartman Institute 12 years ago. In fact, part of the reason I came to the Hartman Institute and wanted to set up shop for the Hartman Institute in North America was because I wanted to live with the dynamism of being a Jew who felt a pull to both places. And I found an institution headquartered in Jerusalem that wanted to set up shop in America, not just to fundraise from North American Jews, but to serve the Jewish people in these two places. And we've been involved in this audacious experiment of being a, a bicontinental dual headquartered institution because that's who the Jewish people are. In all of those journeys back and forth when I go to Israel back um, and then I come home, I have this weird feeling when I land in Israel. Some of you may share this also. I land in Israel and I feel some weird sense of being at home. I do speak Hebrew, so it's part about, about language. Partly it's about the prevalence of Jewish culture, that sense of weird comfort in this place. And then when I return home and I turn the key in the door of my home in the Bronx, I also feel at home. Philo of Alexandria creates a template for this, for the possibility that voluntary diaspora opens, that I'm not in exile unable to be in the place that I wish I could be because of circumstances beyond my control, but constructing a new relationship between home and homeland in ways that could be reinforcing to one another. Philo refers to them as, one of them is the motherland, the metropolis, the place where the religion in some ways is headquartered, and the other is the fatherland, the place where our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers before us were raised and born. And I think part of the gender dynamic of telling that story of the motherland and the fatherland is that I don't think he's embarrassed by the idea that he is a child of both of these civilizations. But the bigger idea that Philo is suggesting, and that's the one I really want us to think about tonight, 
is that in order for this to work, in order for American Jews to lean into our at-homeness, to say even during a time of profound Jewish sovereignty, we can create a homeland project here. And by the way, it doesn't go down the, the silly traps of a Zionism, like, like honestly, Biden Zionism, where I kind of have to pretend that I'm not at home here, nor does it go down the trap of anti-Zionism, where in order to feel comfortable as an American Jew, I have to negate that project. What if I could find a way of deeply articulating that something transformative is happening at this moment in Jewish history, where we are capable of feeling a sense of home and homeland at the same time. But in order for that to mean something, we have to find ways to turn them into mutually reinforcing laboratory projects that create something powerful and beneficial for the Jewish people that go beyond their own limitations. We actually know a lot of the limitations already about a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. A lot of what the Jewish state has had to do in order to articulate itself within the land of Israel has been um, to build a society and a civilization that is really struggling around things like minority rights, around pluralism, even about democracy. Well, those are things that we in America have really thrived with as part of our Jewishness. To most American Jews, rights, pluralism, democracy, that's the, that's the stock and trade of what it means to be an American Jew. Meantime, we as American Jews are oftentimes suffering under the weight of the fact that because we are a minority operating in the civilization, we don't oftentimes create the kind of flourishing Jewish culture that you actually need to thrive and to even to survive. Whereas the state of Israel has that in spades. When you have a government and a public square that is infused with Jewishness, well, it's not always great for democracy, but it's extraordinary for Jewish culture. In order for that analogy to work, in order for us to live at a radical moment in Jewish history, we as American Jews are going to have to lean into our specialness and try to figure out what we have to offer collectively and institutionally to the Jewish people uh, in this moment. I, th I find that Israelis are in living in a period of tremendous curiosity of Ameri about American Jews, sometimes more than we are curious about ourselves. There's been series in Israel over the last couple of years of starting to investigate the really interesting dynamics that the American Jewish community represents. When I travel to Israel and I meet with Israeli school teachers, they are incredibly curious about the dynamism of American Jewry. It's threatening them to them in some ways. They don't really understand this whole experiment with identity that American Jews are engaged with. But they also understand that if they are going to have a long-term relationship to the Jewish people, half of whom is located in America, it's going to have to happen not just through judgment, but through understanding. Out there right now, there's a lot of cheap options, right? We could, we could render ourselves inferior, think of ourselves as still being in exile, and I think that would misrepresent what we've managed to achieve here. There's also the anti-Zionism, maybe that is resentful of the pride of place that homeland has over our sense of home. I wanna try a different experiment to imagine that we are living in something audacious that doesn't actually resemble anything we have seen since 2000 years ago. Neither exile nor homeland, right? In the geographic sense and or the theological sense, but something quite different, a home that can coexist with a homeland. And the reason for this, the reason it's so important is Jewish communities, as with families, as with individuals, need myths. We need stories. We take pride in those stories. And when we have a serious story that we tell about ourselves, it also enables us to take responsibility for shaping it. There is American turbulence right now, and we Jews are participants in it, active enthusiasts sometimes, some in the, in the factors that, that make America struggle. And we are not sure where American Jews are going to sort out. What happens when we name ourselves as living through an extraordinary epic in Jewish history? Not just living through it, but creating it. That it is something, this thing, this project we are engaged with, this thing of being American and Jewish at this moment of Jewish history is of historic significance and demands of us an enormous responsibility. Love to hear your thoughts. Yehuda, that was uh, 
one of the most thought provoking um, lectures, set of remarks that I've ever heard. Um, and I want to um, take the opportunity to ask something that that came to my mind um, first, and then I have just a, there's a, just a few questions in Q and A. So I want everyone to know you haven't had you didn't know in advance, but go ahead and put your questions in there, and we will have a record of them. And over the course of today and tomorrow, we'll try to get to them, or in another way, you know, at some point after this. But I want to go back to. Um, this bold or audacious recognition here in this place of being similar to, to the others. Um, the others, other groups that are equally situated here. What does it mean uh, for intergroup relations? Mm -hmm. What is our responsibility um, as one of many groups at home here um, when tradi some traditional alliances yeah. are in questions, our behavior is pos and expectations of traditional partners is perhaps more, you know, extreme. Mm -hmm. um, where do we go and what is our obligation in shaping this chapter, you know, continuing to evolve this chapter of Jewish life here? What is our obligation? What are the possibilities in intergroup relations? Wonderful. It's a wonderful question. You know, I, I want to use, I'll, I'll use two examples ar around um, intergroup relations, and I think they're the most the trickiest ones. Uh, one of them is about Black Jewish relations, and the other is about um, Muslim Jewish relations. Uh, and both of them are, are areas where we've um, done a little bit of work in the space, but mostly I'm speaking today as an observer uh, rather than a participant in this. Um, the central problem that we seem to have around both of these stories is that the American Jewish community does not notice uh, oftentimes its own dynamism and its own historical change as it tries to maintain and sustain these relationships. I'll give two examples. When it comes to Muslim Jewish relations, if you go back about 20 years, um, right before 9-11, the Muslim American community was on the rise uh, socioeconomically and otherwise. In fact, there were a lot of signs that they were, it takes a few generations to do this, but a community that had a predominant immigration in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s, or rather 70s and 80s, was starting to kind of peak the way that American Jews did uh, one, gener one or two generations after our arrival in all of the kinds of social and economic climbing that American Jews had done. And then 9-11 hit. By the way, actually, the majority, this is an incredible fact, the majority of Muslim Americans uh, voted for George W. Bush in 2000. And then 9-11 hits. And suddenly overnight, the social position of American Muslims goes from being hanging out in the middle, drops precipitously to the, the most despised American religious population below the always, the winner had always been atheists. Americans don't like atheists. Mm -hmm. But Muslim drops below. Now, what now what happens now? <laughs> because if we have been building a kind of alliances with the Muslim American community on the basis of similarity, well, that responsibility now becomes something radically different. And the Muslim community kind of got desperate and started to say, what are the things we're going to start doing to try to rebuild a relationship with the Jewish community on the basis of the fact that we now desperately need those types of relationships? So in some cases, you see audacious efforts, bold efforts to say we're willing to rethink all of our commitments because we actually need the Jewish community in different ways. Um, and some, in some ways, I don't want to get all into this, but some of what we've seen in the last just handful of years around anti-Zionism is a pushback against that. People got, they got fed up. They gave up on it. And it, what I want to see is us in that story. We were, they were changing and we were on the rise. And therefore it raises incredibly interesting questions about how do you use your access? Um, I remember a few years ago with one of my colleagues, we did a talk, a Muslim Jewish talk. And the, the Christian theologian, Christopher Stendhal has a great line, which is in interfaith context, you, you talk about holy envy. What are the things that you, um, holy envy is the things that you describe as being envious of another faith. So one person asked, 
you know, me and the Imam uh, who are speaking, what is some, what is one thing that you're each envious of with the other? Um, and he said, I'm envious of the power of American Jewish institutions. We're, we mock our own institutions. We think we're in decline, but they're looking at us like, wow, look at this community that actually knows how to advocate for itself, that pays its rabbis decent wage, right? That has rabbinical schools in America, which American Muslims don't have. And my answer to him was numbers, <laughs> right? So they, they're envious. And I just want to listen for the dynamism of that change. And I'll say just briefly on the black Jewish piece, this too is a place where we are not conscious of our own place in history. Black Jewish relations right now are suffering in America because the American Jewish community thinks it's still in the 60s. It looks nostalgically back at the role that some American Jews played in the civil rights movement and thinks that that buys you indefinitely good relationships with your black neighbors. Well, again, American Jewish community is not the Jewish community of the 1960s. And the black community is not the community of the 1960s. Um, and when we think that that it, again, it's the same message of, of recognizing that you're alive in a period of historical dynamism. And then asking not, hey, on MLK Day, what we need to do is show a film of, um, uh, you know, Heschel and King, but ask, what does it look like to show up differently today because of the changing dynamics of our community and another community? Hmm. Okay. Um... I, of course, uh, it has come up in our in our Q and A about anti-Semitism, and the rise in incidents and acts of anti-Semitism, and the the incident in Colleyville that you mentioned was thirty minutes away. Yeah, and and speaking of interfaith, you know, there was um, there was quite a bit of outreach and recognition and friendship, but also, um, you know. Uh, new, not even new, but even more fear um, and a sense of, um, of um, being persecuted and other. So um, how, how would you respond to, um, to someone who would say, why should we assume that our place here will always be safe when it has never been before? So I would never assume that, right? I would never assume that that's the case. Now, listen, the tragedy of Jewish history is that virtually all of our diasporas have ended in tragedy. However, so have the sovereignty stories. So the notion that like this one is going to fail, but the sovereignty story is going to succeed. If we're only using the precedent of the past, I have really bad news for you. Now, what that leads us to is... It's one thing to say, let's, let's be cautious around the language of home and homeland because we're nervous that it might end badly. But I wanna tell you that is a one-way street towards enabling it to help end badly. <laughs> because instead of saying, what, what agency and autonomy do we have as Jews for the American project? We start getting in our head, this is going badly. And the minute it starts getting down that road, you wind up ironically facilitating Jewish otherness instead of investing in the kinds of real transformative relationships for the American project, we invest entirely in protecting ourselves from it. But what if we actually had a role in this? I published something this past week on it. What if American Jews said, our project is American democracy? Not just protecting ourselves from other Americans, but what could we do with a collective sense? Find What are the ways in which liberal and conservative American Jews could identify the places where we are both beneficiaries of an infrastructural framework that we are dependent on. So it's not about winning and losing all the time in that framework. It's figuring out what we hold and share in common. That's the play for the American Jewish future in America. And the last thing I'll say on this is, there's much more to say on anti-Semitism, but one of the, th there have been anti-Semitic attacks on Jews throughout Jewish history, wherever we have lived. But I'll tell you what there never was before. In Pittsburgh, after the Squirrel Hill shooting, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, front page um, after the shooting, ran, you remember this, the image? Yeah. It's an iconic mm -hmm. image in Jewish history. And it said, in Aramaic, above the fold, Yit gadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah. Now, why is that so significant? Because Americans today process anti-Semitism as an attack on Americanness. 
In every other civilization that Jews have lived, anti-Semitism was understood as an attack on Jews that is either tacitly or explicitly okay. <laughs> sometimes we'll protect the Jews when it's politically useful for us to do so, and sometimes we won't. Americans overwhelmingly understand anti-Semitism as an attack on the fiber of America. Now, I don't think it means anti-Semitism is going to stop, but I think we have to see that as a huge asset in the fight against anti-Semitism. We have to lean into it. We have to keep reinforcing it. And I'll say personally, when I saw Nazis marching in Charlottesville, of course I was hurt as a Jew, but I was offended as an American. <laughs> I want to embrace that and then to say what might we be able to do in this cultural context that is unusual that the battle of anti-Semitism has never been able to do in any other place before. Okay. Um, we, we only get one more question so I'm going to combine two different ones they're both uh, and, and let you end. Mm -hmm. um, let you end on um, how did you respond to each of the, the members of Congress. Um, but but I have a question. Um, what about collective memory? Um, and how does that play in to our ability to to relax into this situatedness, I think you've called it, um, without having in the back of our minds the idea that we may need to pack our bags? Or is that a way to live? I want to say to you that like oh, this whole story is so optimistic that I've never thought about the packing your bags question. Mm -hmm. But like there was a thread on Twitter last week where someone said something like, what's something that you think is in a, is in a Jewish home that is in all Jewish homes, but might not be in non-Jewish homes? It's like, a, you know, it was a game. And one of the answers that I just, I almost gasped at was passports. Hmm. We keep our passports, we keep them up to date, you know about it. It's, I wouldn't, it would be naive for me to say that like, we, you know, we should let go of that collective trauma because we're here and at home. But I want to repeat, the fact that you hold on to a collective trauma, I mean, the whole notion of trauma is something that can either hold sway over you, or you can figure out how to use it. If you've ever gone to therapy, right, this is what we do. The, it, when, when trauma holds sway over you, it controls you. You lose your autonomy as a result of it. You become obsessed with it. You, you let it define your life and your choices. The healthiest thing we can do as a Jewish people living in the period that we live with the ability to actually not just go to therapy, but I mean, <laughs> but actually like play out what this story of arrival means is to try to work on like what of that is actually useful to us as Jews, right? Being cautious, being real, like being realist. Those are good lessons from Jewish history and Jewish memory. But when we become obsessed with the narrative that we are on the verge of extermination, you lose all of your agency to, to create a vibrant Jewish civilization. You start seeing everybody around you as your enemy and your threat. And I think in the context of the American Jewish project, it is way too early and way too unhealthy to kind of seize that traumatic story and to use it as a means of, of debilitating our own agency. I think it's, that's the worst way, the, bad, the worst for the Jews. I guess my answer on the congressman is I mostly let them argue, right? Sometimes a good teacher gets out of the way, right? Um, I wanted them to own that story. And then we, stu we, we actually stu studied a few pieces of Talmud together on, on why that question is so profound in the history of Jewish diasporas. Um, because the, the, in some ways, and this is part of your trauma question also, the most powerful thing we might be able to do as Jews in America right now is hear each other's stories as well, is listen to it also. To name that like our anxieties are not just meant to kind of spin around and spiral with us until we lose control over them, but are the tools by which we actually, when you hear other people's stories, they hear yours. It actually can be a tool for building resilient community. I think we're not doing enough of that um, as a Jewish people. And part of what I wanted to do tonight was tell this story from 30,000 feet. And now kind of the next piece of work is to process it mm -hmm. through our own experiences of why we gravitate towards one part of the story or another. Okay. Well, you've raised the bar yet again for our Arnie Sweet Scholar in Residence series. 
Um, you've provoked some real deep thought and introspection and leave us with great possibilities for this, this chapter, um, this moment um, that we may call a voluntary diaspora. So thank you. And I hope we see many of you tomorrow at our Lunch and Learn. It has been a great um, pleasure. Good night. Lai la 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 Shalom, 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 shalom